We've come to the beginning of the mediation uh, section of today. We're just going to extend from now until uh, mid-afternoon. And this is the picture to behold. But we're going to find new wrinkles to this picture. So if, it's good that you feel familiar with it now, but because soon it's going to be all... We have a way of making it complex, don't we? So let's define some terms first. So we're going to talk about, you know, in, in regular mediation modeling, you have an X variable, an M variable, and a Y variable. So we're going to talk about the X variable. So in line with epidemiological literature, we're going to call this X variable an exposure variable now to move you slowly into uh, modern mediation analysis terminology. Uh, you can just think of it as a binary treatment control variable if you want, although it can certainly be uh, continuous. But in epi, I guess they talk about exposure. Maybe it's you know, exposure to lead or something like that. And we're going to have a control variable C. That's the notation they use. And then, of course, the mediator is M and the outcome is Y. So if you look at this, you know that the usual uh, indirect effect is beta 1 times gamma 1. And the usual direct effect is beta 2. Right? Now, we, we want to encourage uh, people to in include control variables uh, because for, s for several good reasons. Uh, you saw in uh, Morton's example of uh, aggressive disruptive behavior in Baltimore public schools that C was actually uh, aggressive behavior uh, pre-intervention. And then he looked at uh, aggression in grade 5, which would then be, say, the M here. You know, say, just considering this simple regression. But anyway, even in, in a randomized study, is it useful to have a, a control variable because it increases the power to de detect effect? You know, to think about ANCOVA, for instance. But uh, in mediation studies, even more so, uh, it helps you avoid a basic problem, an Achilles heel of mediation analysis, namely uh, the potential for a, a correlation between M and Y that is not accounted for by the model. You know, here now we say that C influences both of these two. But if you draw, didn't have C, but it still influenced both of them, that would imply that the residuals of Y and M would be correlated. And you can't estimate that correlation on top of this regression. It's not identified. So there you have C to avoid so-called mediator outcome confounding, which is, uh, like I said, the Achilles heel of mediation analysis. In this case, we have no interactions, uh, no moderation, that is. So it's very simple. But uh, we're going to go to uh, a first case of interaction. In the book, uh, we, we uh, distinguish between three cases. Different authors have different uh, classification system, like Chris Preacher has one and uh, Andrew Hayes has another. So now we're going to look at case XZ. So uh, we're going to moderate uh, the regression of Y on X and M on X by Z. So if you look at M, so look at this picture. You, what you should think about, these are two regressions. You have two dependent variables. You regress M on these, and you regress Y on all of these. So uh, we have X times C moderating the regression of M on X. And we have X times C moderating the regression of Y primarily on M here. So, and, and, and X, I should say. So in this case, we have uh, indirect and direct formulas down at the bottom here. And the uh, indirect formula is beta 1 times gamma 1, but plus the term beta 1 times gamma 3, z. So this is the moderator that Morton talked about in the first regression example. <clears throat> and then we're going to get you used to the notation of x1 minus x0 in parentheses here. Usually this is 1, so it disappears. It doesn't show up. Why is it 1? Well, for two reasons. Uh, one is if x is continuous, we usually consider a one standard deviation change in x when we talk about an indirect effect. 
So x1 minus x0 is 1. So it's for, for one standard deviation, say increase in x, uh, how, how big is the indirect effect? Or in treatment control studies, x1 is 1 and x0 is 0. So that also comes out to be 1. But we're going to see that uh, working with x1 and x0 explicitly is, uh, makes it possible for us to come up with more general uh, indirect or direct formulas for uh, new types of applications. All right, so that's fairly familiar. The direct effect is beta 2 plus, but also beta 4 via z connects to x. So you're probably familiar with that formula. Now, uh, case 2. Then you have m interacting with z. So there, you only are the, the mod moderation is only with respect to y as a dependent variable. That is, z moderates the effect of m on y. And again, uh, you see it in the indirect effect here. In the indirect effect is not only beta 1 times gamma 1, but it's beta 4 times c times gamma 1. So z moderates the effect. Uh, with respect to how m influences y. So uh, that regression has a different slope uh, depending on the z values. And still you have the x1 minus x0 and the direct beta 2 x1 minus x0. It's quite simple in that case. Now case 3, that's when the action starts getting really interesting. <clears throat> and this really shows the strength of what we're going to talk about after lunch, namely the modern mediation analysis topic using so-called counterfactually defined causal indirect and direct effects. This is the case that these people who uh, do research in the causal effect area brings up because it, it is this, the best uh, example where all variables m and y are continuous but still it's complex enough to try to come up with the in, what the indirect and direct effects are. And I bet you, you have never seen this direct effect expression. Because I haven't found it in the uh, psychometric literature or in the uh, mediation literature. I've seen this indirect effect derived, but not this. So what we're talking about is the case of m multiplying x. So the moderator is still uh, in the regression of y on m and x. And the, mo the moderator is x itself, or m. You can see m as the moderator, I guess. And uh, the indirect effect is beta 1 times uh, gamma 1, beta 1 times gamma 1, and then beta 3 times x1, which is the x1 value here, which is one of these values that we do for comparison. So that's a novelty already. We have never before seen. Uh, the uh, comparison point, x1, brought into the indirect effect formula. So with that kind of interaction, m times x, you actually, uh, the size of the indirect effect depends on where, you, where on the x, uh, x scale you make the comparison. So x1 comes in there. And in the direct effect, x0 comes in here. You know, so they're not only out here. But they enter the formulas. So x0, that, that comparison point, the lower comparison point, comes into play in the direct effect. I think you would be very hard pressed probably to intuitively come up with these formulas by looking at the path diagram. It would be very hard. We need a principle for deriving these. And that's what we're going to talk about at length when we talk about modern mediation modeling. Another interesting feature here in the direct effect is that gamma 0, which is the intercept in the regression of m on these variables, plays a role in the direct effect. Never before have we seen an inter intercept playing a role in a, an effect, right? That's not the classic um, mediation case. So x1 and x0 get involved, and gamma 0 get involved, and c gets involved. That is, the comparison value, the value of the control variable gets involved. So it depends on which value of the control variable you think is relevant. It 
the direct effect will change as a function of that. So it's a very, un very different formula. And in fact, you make, you, when you have these kinds of models, interaction between m and x in their influence on y, you want to be sure that you have your control variables in a scale that you really want them to be. For instance, you may want to center them so that they have mean zero. So you want to make this direct effect at the mean, in which case this term uh, gets eliminated, falls out. And if this beta 3, this uh, moderator effect here, if that, if that is not zero, if that's actually non-zero, the indirect effect exists even if beta 1 is zero. So beta 1 can be zero, but there's still an, so this could be zero, and it could still be an indirect effect because it's beta 3 x1 times gamma 1. So it's a very unusual case in many regards, right? And that's why the causal effects people love to bring it up. Uh, this case where m and x interact, interact in the effect of y. So the treatment, you get the treatment and you get a high m value. Those two together generate a good desirable outcome for y. People overlook that case. I mean, it has been studied in the uh, old the classic mediation literature, but um, it's often overlooked because beta 3 is often uh, insignificant. And that's usually, that's often the case when you talk about slope or coefficients for interactions. The power to reject that they're zero is very low. You need large samples for that. And we're going to talk about uh, the p possible virtue of including that interaction effect even when it's insignificant. But we'll get back to that. So um, this is three moderation cases. And here is a cheat sheet for a, or a summary of M plus options. And you may want to scribble here uh, that in the version 8 users guide, these options are described in detail on the pages 763 to 766. 763 to 766. Describe these different options. No moderation, you write it as usual with int in the model indirect command. Moderation with z. Uh, case one here, where there's a typo here that you should correct. This z should, uh, spell, should be an x. This should be an x right there. That's case one, uh, moderation. This is case two, moderation. Here you have case one combined with case two, and at the bottom you have case three. These kinds of expressions are also used uh, when we talk about the uh, modern mediation modeling and uh, the counterfactually defined effects. And with that, I'm going to hand over it, and we're going to see some examples. Yes. All right, so now we're going to look at some classic mediation examples. So the first one is on uh, work team performance. So we have the model here. This is a case two, according to the book. So what we have here is uh, dysfunctional behavior. And this is uh, how often uh, a worker uh, engages in weakening of others' work somehow. So that, I guess that would be if Bengt undermines what I say. Uh, when he talks, something, something like that. Uh, and then negtone, which is negative effects about the work, if you have uh, negative effects associated to, to your work in your workplace. And then the outcome is performance or work efficiency. So this is a, kind of a common outcome that uh, employers are interested in. How can they increase the efficiency? What should they change? And then we also have the negexp, which is the Nonverbal ability to express, express negative emotions. So the nonverbal ability, if you can show how you feel, basically, without saying anything. Uh, and then we have M said here in this case. Uh, let me just see that. Which is then, of course, uh, negtones times negexp. So if you have negative effects, uh, 
and if you are able to express them non-verbally. So uh, one story here could be, for example, that uh, if you are treating your workers and undermining their work, then you, you might, up on the, might end up having a lot of negative emotions associated to your workplace because you have this bad environment. And that might, of course, affect your work efficiency or performance. And also then, if you are, have a low ability to express how you feel non-verbally, so no one can see that you're feeling bad about this, then it's hard for anyone to regulate this. So it might be even worse for you to have negative effects about your workplace if you're unable to express them, for example. So this could be one reason to look at this. So how would we set this up then? Uh, so it's nothing new except that we have to create this interaction variable. And when we want to define something, we have already done this in the first one, we just use the define statement and we say we want to call M said is neg tone, so the negative effects times neg exp, the nonverbal ability to express negative emotions. Uh, and then what we will use throughout when we do mediation analysis with the maximum likelihood estimator, we will also use base later, but now when we're in the maximum likelihood framework, we will use the bootstraps. And that's, uh, we will use it for the confidence intervals, and that's to, that is to be able to capture the non-symmetry and the skewness that we kind of anticipate in the uh, sampling distribution of especially the indirect effects. So we will have this kind of as, as a default. We will always use the bootstrap confidence interval when we, when we do mediation analysis with the maximum likelihood estimator. And we will see why in a couple of slides. And then we just put up our model. We have two regressions here. We have the regression of the outcome on the uh, negative effects, the dysfunctionality, or the exposure in this case, the uh, nonverbal ability to express negative emotions, and the interaction between these two. And then the mediator is only regressed on the exposure. Oh, sorry, yeah, on the dis uh, exposure dysfunctional behavior. And then we come to the model indirect command, which is the way that we get the indirect and direct effects for these models. And there's uh, some things to think about here. There's a lot of information here and a lot of things that are important. So the first thing I want you to note is the order here. And that's why Bengt gave you the sheet sheet. What's that? The slide, uh, I forget the number now, but the slide where we, where we, all these definitions of what order it should be in what case. So you can keep track of this. But I will go through it. So what you have is, first of all, we're going to use the mod option because we have moderated mediation. So we're going to use mod rather than ind. So the mod option. And the order is the outcome, and then the option mod, and then the mediator, neg tone, and then the moderator, neg exp. And we have some values in parentheses after that, but let's skip that, so just the order. So the outcome, mod, mediator, moderator, then the interaction verbal, m said, and finally the exposure, dysfunk, which also has values in parentheses afterwards. So let's look at the values within parentheses now when we know the order. And you don't have to recall, remember this order. You have this order on the slider. So, you, so the first values here are neg x, so the moderator, and then we have from minus 4 to 0 0.6 with the increment 0 0.1. So this kind of very much resembles what we did with the loop command before. So this is exactly what we're doing here. We want to see uh, the indirect and the direct effects for different values of the moderator, right? Because it will change as a function of the moderator. That's why we have the moderator. So, we will, so this will give us a plot that gives us the effect uh, as a function of the moderator at, over this, uh, for these values, from minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, with, and the increment just gives the smoothness of the plot drop, how many points we're estimating. And this is, corresponds, in this case, to the 20th and the 80th percentile of the moderator. And the moderator, in this case, was the nonverbal ability to express uh, negative emotions. And then the values within parentheses after the exposure that corresponds to the x0 and x1, right? Because we have to say for what shift in the exposure, the exposure is a continuous variable. So for what shift in the exposure do we want to see these effects? So uh, in this case, we will go from the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. So you write the highest value first and then, so this is an increase from the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. If this would have been a binary exposure, we, didn't, we wouldn't have to write anything because the, the, the default shift is from 0 to 1, which is in a binary exposure. Right? You, you either it's given the treatment or you didn't have the treatment. But in this case, we have to cha uh, choose for what values we want to evaluate the effect. And then again, we use the C interval within parentheses bootstrap here to use the bootstrap samples for the confidence intervals. Uh, and then the plot here, I can just say here, we ask for type 
equals plot3 in the plot command, we get these kinds of plots. And here we have exactly this. So you can see here on the x-axis we have negx, which is the moderator. And this plot starts at 0 point, minus 0 0.4 and ends at 0 0.6. And the smoothness of this corresponds to this increment 0 0.1. So this corresponds to the value in parentheses after the moderator that we saw on the previous slide. So these values. And the line in the middle is the point estimate, and these bands are the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval, and we have then the indirect effect now on the y-axis. So we can see how the indirect effect of the dysfunctional, the dysfunctional behavior mediated through uh, negative effects about work, the indirect effect on the work efficiency here as a function of the moderator nonverbal ability to express negative emotions. So actually we see that when the negative the non-verbal ability increases, the negative effect increases, right? Because this is negative values that becomes larger and larger. So the negative effect increases. It's a lot of negatives back and forth there. So as the non-verbal ability to express negative emotions increase, the negative effect of dysfunctional behavior mediated by negative emotions on the work efficiency becomes larger. So the negative effect becomes larger. Or you could say, for individuals with a high nonverbal ability, it's worse to have negative effects. So this is kind of the opposite of what I suggested with my story. It's actually the other way around. If you have a high ability to express your emotions, it's even worse to have negative effects about work. So maybe it's some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or something. You, you show everyone that you're feeling bad, so the, and then everyone treats you like you're, you're a grumpy person, so your work efficiency becomes even worse. So that's what we see here. As the moderator increases, the negative effect increases as well. And you can see here that it's significant for values larger than minus 0 0.15, for example, where the confidence interval does not cover zero. So one thing uh, you have to think about here, when you specify a model like this in M plus, you, you uh, estimate both models at the same time, both regressions at the same time, which will give you two degrees of freedom that you don't want, in a sense. Uh, and this will give you a very bad chi-square fit. And if we go back to the model diagram here, essentially what we have left out here is the correlation between the residual and the, the moderator and the residual and the interaction variable here. Do you mind? Uh, we ask that questions be asked at the question and answer session, it, unless it's totally confusing. Yeah. What what is missing? No, the moderator here is the negative nonverbal ability to express negative emotion. That's measured. Okay, let's get back to it during the questions and answer questions, I guess, yeah. so we don't. No, it is correct. It is correct. Yeah, okay, so you're gonna yeah it's correct. It's correct. correct. I know that. <laughs> no, but I think I mean this is I mean the, this different cases. Uh, I, it wasn't that many years ago that I understood this. I, I still kind of recall the. It's kind of dif difficult to get all these different cases. I, it took a long time for me to kind of internalize how they make sense. But hopefully it will unfold. We'll see. Uh, where were I? Yeah, okay, so we left out these, these two covariances here between uh, these two. And that will give you a bad model fit here. And this is nothing that you should bother about, really. But if you want to aesthetically make this output look better, you can saturate this model by allowing the, this uh, covariance, by, by mentioning this statement in the model command. And this will not affect any of the other estimates, not the point estimates or the standard error estimates of the rest of the model. So this is purely aesthetical. But maybe you have to send this output so, to some colleague that is not as good at statistics that you are. So that person might get very worried about this bad fit and everything. And you, you don't have time to explain because you have to go to courses like this. And, uh. <laughs> uh. All right, so another case, case three, which Bank mentioned. It's a case where what we should, what, which we should always kind of consider when we have a simple mediation model. We have an exposure, mediator, and an outcome. 
is the interaction between the exposure and the mediator. So mx here. Uh, so, and as you can see, as Bengt already mentioned, you can see that the values of uh, x, in this case, uh, affects the indirect and direct effect. So in, in the indirect effect, it's the x1 value, and in the direct effect, it's the x0 value, uh, but it's also the shift. So like Bengt said, it doesn't, it doesn't only matter how large this shift is, so from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 2, that's a shift of one unit, right? But actual value, 0 or 1 or 1 or 2, matters here for the effect. And the reason why we should always increase this, I think uh, Van der Wille wrote a nice quote in his book, Exploration in, in Causality, which you can, I will give you some seconds to read this, and then I will try to summarize it. So essentially what he says here is that even though you might be tempted, like Bank said, to exclude this kind of interaction if it's not significant, maybe we should include it or keep it anyway unless it doesn't change the effects, the indirect and direct effect, if we remove it. And that's because usually it takes huge samples to find significant interactions. But that doesn't mean that there is no interaction. So it might still be very important for the dynamics of this mediation, right? So to really capture how this works, like for example with the baseline aggression thing, that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that it would matter if you have a high baseline aggression if we talk about if we can change your aggressive behavior. So, so uh, and that might, of course, interact. So, so kind of as a default, we should include it and keep it unless it doesn't affect the results. So how do we do it then? Well. It's very similar to the, to the setup we have uh, previous. We create this interaction variable in the defined statement. So we create mx, which is the product of the mod, uh, mediator and the exposure. And then we just do the model. So y in this case is regressed also on the interaction besides the mediator and the exposure. And in the model indirect command now, uh, again, I refer back to the, to the sheet where you have all these different kinds. This is the case three. We have the outcome and then the mod option because it's still a moderated mediation model. But then we have the mediator and then straight to the interaction variable because we don't have any external moderator here, right? The exposure is both the exposure and the moderator, essentially. So we don't include that, so we go straight for the interaction variable mx in the order here and end up with the exposure. And again now, after the exposure, if it is a continuous variable, we have to say for what shift in the exposure we want to see these effects. So this is from the mean 5 to, I think, one standard deviation above 5, uh, 7 in this case. Uh, all right, so how would you then simulate on this? I mean, why would we want to simulate models with moderated mediation? Well, maybe to see what it takes to get a, a significant interaction effect. We might be interested in the interaction effect, right? So we want, might want to design a study where we know that we have power to detect significant interaction if there is one. So you can simulate this in M plus, of course, and see what it would take. How large sample, how large sample would you need to be able to find a in, uh, significant interaction with some probability? Uh, and to do this, you kind of have to learn a trick. You have to realize that you can write the um, interaction as a random slope. So if we look at these three, so now it's x and z here, moderation. Uh, so the trick here is that we can write the slope of x with a subscript i. So if we look at the regression of m here, we can write it with a subset i where the subset refers to this function. So each individual's slope of x is this linear deterministic function of z. So if you would insert now 32 into 31, so this expression instead of this gamma here, put this expression in, you have x times gamma 1 and then x times z gamma 3. So you have these two terms. So if you realize that you can write it in this way, then this is an excellent trick which you have to use to, to generate this data in M+. I don't hear you. Sorry. Here? It's here. Oh, so it's measured at baseline. It's a, yeah. So this, would, this could be baseline aggression 
This could be aggression at uh, grade five, and this could be high school dropout, for example. I will have an example of that later. Okay, so if you see this, uh, you understand that, that you can actually view uh, the inter interaction variable as a, uh, kind of a random slope. And how would you generate this then? Well, okay, I'll, I'll just repeat this slide one more time from the beginning. So what we have here is we have x z, so interaction between these two, and this affects only the mediator. So only the mediator has the interaction effect. So it's only in the mediator uh, equation that we have to take this into account somehow. And the way we do it is to set a subscript i on the slope of x, saying that each individual have their own treatment effect, their own slope of the treatment or exposure, their own slope of x. And this slope is a deterministic function, a linear function of z, which is the moderator. So if you would put this expression here, gamma 1 plus gamma 3 z i, in, and uh, substitute this gamma 1 i here with this expression, you would have parentheses around this, and then gamma 1, gamma 3 z, end parenthesis, and then x i. So if you would multiply that in then, you would have the term x i times gamma 1, and x i times this term, which would correspond to the interaction equation. The, the regression with interaction. For each individual. Yeah. Uh, and the way you generate this data then is, so I'm not going to go through all of this. I'm just going to say really quickly that you can specify how many replications you want to do in a simulation study, 500 in this case, and you can say the data if you want to for each replication. And the way you then uh, specify the random slope is you use this statement. So in the regression of M regressed on X, so the mediator on the exposure, we're going to have the random slope gamma 1. So gamma 1 is the name of this random slope, and the random slope is indicated by this vertical bar here. So M on X will have a random slope gamma 1. And then the following three lines is that, says that gamma 1 will have an intercept of 0 0.3, and it will be a function of Z where the slope of Z is 0 0.2. Recall, this is, we simulate data here, so we, we can decide exactly what, how to generate this. And finally, we set the residual variance of gamma 1 to 0. So it's a deterministic. We don't have any residual term here. It will be this deterministic function that we talked about. And that's how you go about it. Uh, I'll just briefly show you the output, because it differs a bit from when you, do, uh, when you don't do a simulation study, when you do, just do analysis of a data set. You have now more columns that you have to take into account. The first one is similar for us. So for example, gamma 1 on Z. Uh, the population value, that's the true value, something that we have to specify. What, what did, how, we did, how did we generate this data? So the true value was 0 0.2, which I specified before. And the average, because these results are the summaries of the 500 replications that we did. So it's the summaries of these. So the average of all the 500 point estimates for this parameter were 0 0.2, 0 0.201, which is very close to uh, 0 0.20. So it's a good, on average, it did really well. And then we have the standard deviation, which is uh, the empirical standard deviation of all these uh, estimates. So you just calculate the standard deviation of these 500 point estimates. And that should correspond to the standard error average, right? Because the standard error is a, the estimate that we get for each of these replications that should correspond to the empirical standard deviation. So if, if everything goes well, then these should be comparable. If the standard error estimate is a good, is able to capture the true uh, variability in this estimate, then these two should be close, and they are. And then we have three columns in addition to this, which are the MSE, mean squared error, which, which is kind of a combination of the bias and the variance of this, so it's kind of a precision measure. And then we have the 95% coverage, uh, which is the proportion of confidence intervals that covered the true value. And this corresponds to the frequentistic definition of a confidence interval. If we would repeat this over and over, then in 95% of the cases, the confidence interval would cover the true value, right? So the, the, the goal here is 95. So this is actually spot on, which is really good. And finally, we have the percentage of significant coefficient. So the proportion of confidence intervals that did not cover zero, because that would be a significant effect. It's significantly different from zero. In this case, we can see that 74.4% of these effects were significant. And we can see from some others here, uh, we have only 60% to 75%, which would indicate that the sample size we used, 400, is not enough to get the power that we would like. Usually we talk about power above 0 0.8 or 80% as good power. 
So in this case, we would have to increase the number of participants. And then you can really see that it takes a lot to get significant interactions here and to get these models to be all significant. And if you don't have anything to add, Bengt, I think you can talk about sensitivity analysis. I don't know anything about it. Oh, it's too bad. Gamma 1 on Z in the diagram? Uh, gamma 1 on Z uh, is this gamma 3. So that's this one. So uh, gamma 1 on Z, this is the critical one. You know, this is lower than 0.8, as, as Morton mentioned. And uh, that is the one that we often interactions like that that we often f find insignificant. So it's this one that we're talking about. So the first row in the output correspond to that. All right. So we are now sitting right here, folks. We're right in between classic and modern. Sort of a paradigm shift taking place here now. That was my paradigm shift. So um, it's, it isn't. It really isn't classic, and it's not necessarily part of the modern, but this idea came up uh, in the modern mediation analysis context. It's an idea from the, the causal, causal uh, effect group of researchers. So here's how it goes in a shortened version. A longer version is in the book. Uh, we have the standard picture here, x influencing m and y, and m influencing y, and we have a control variable c. I was mentioning that c is good for many reasons. It increases the power to be able to detect effects of x on y, but it's also a way to uh, control for possible confounding, mediator outcome confounding. And that is, if we leave out c, which we show in the bottom picture, there's no c here, right? But if it's that is, if in the analysis we leave out C, but C really should be part of the model, it does influence M and Y, but it's not in the model, then it will cause this, these residuals to be correlated, right? And that's the mediated outcome confounding. And then uh, in the uh, causal effect literature, particularly by uh, IMAI, I-M-A-I, in psychological methods and in statistical science. You have the references in the book. Uh, he came up with an idea to actually study the effect of this kind of residual correlation. So what statisticians do when they find that a model is non-identified is to do so-called sensitivity analysis. You can imagine that you can fix this correlation, even though you can't estimate it because it's not identified on top of this effect. You can fix it at different values and see, uh, while well, you estimate this and see and this, and see how the effects are affected by that. In a very shallow way, that description, that is what uh, Imai suggested. So this residual correlation, we'll call it rho, cannot be identified, but we can do the sensitivity analysis. And we're going to look at graphs that show effects and confidence intervals as a function of rho. And the question here is, is the estimated effect still significant for a realistic range of row values? So I'll give you an example of that. And it's um, in the simulated part of the sensitivity analysis description. So here we're looking at the indirect effect on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have rho, the correlation between the residual. You can go from minus 1 to plus 1. And here we have a situation. We can follow the bullets here. It's very clearly laid out. The true indirect effect is 0 0.25. True indirect effect is here. You can write 0 0.25. That, that's where you scribble it. Or you can do it here, too. Now, standard assumption is that rho is equal to 0. If rho is equal to 0, this is the estimate that we will get, 0 0.36. So scribble 0 0.36 here. So if you generate data uh, and analyze where you have a certain row correlation and analyze it without it, you're going to get an indirect effect estimate that's 0 
instead of 0 0.25. The true row is 0 0.30. So we generate data with true row 0 0.30. And that is uh, here. If you do a line here, draw a line down to this. Uh, this is the, hits the row value 0 0.3. So that is when you, at, if you were fixing rho at its true value 0 0.3, you would get the right indirect effect value of 0 0.25. Are you following me? Yeah. You don't. You don't know what rho is. But, well, I'm demonstrating uh, to you what would happen if you have if you happen to get the right value. I'm, I'm just building up to how to interpret this. Now, you never know what rho is, but we'll get to that. So true rho is the x-axis value that gives you true indirect effect, so it's here. So now, you look at this graph. You have the uh, indirect effect uh, values here, and you have the confidence intervals. And what you w would want you know, is an indirect effect uh, that is, in this case, significantly different from zero. And you would get that in this over here, you get it here, but then here is where the lower confidence band hits uh, indirect effect of zero. So out here, for these row values, we cannot reject that the indirect effect is zero. For these high row values, uh, we can't reject that the indirect effect is zero. So that's what it says here. The unknown row needs to be higher than 0 0.6 for the effect to be significant, but for the effect to be insignificant. So the way you reason about this, you say that kind of a high row value, 0 0.6 is a high residual correlation, is unlikely to happen. So that's, you can reason about that. Therefore, the effect can be considered trustworthy or robust. You know, if, if that line had crossed the y equals zero line here somewhere for a very ro low row value, you wouldn't have much confidence in the indirect effect. Because you, there's so many factors that can come into play that unobserved variables, not measured variables, that influence both m and y. So, this, so the take home message from this graph is if you get a, a graph like this, you should be happy. That's a simple message. Uh, Morten will show you a graph where you're not so fortunate. But this is um, the steps that you take. So I actually generate, in the book you show, uh, I show how to generate uh, data with a true row of 0 0.30 and then analyze it by the standard assumption and then you get the misestimated indirect effect of 0 0.36, that is that value, whereas the true indirect effect is 0 0.25, which you would get if you happen to guess true row value 0 0.30, but you don't. All right, so now you know how to reason about this and how to do a sensitivity analysis and how to uh, interpret the graph. So now it's all clear, and here comes Morton. He's going to complicate matters. Yeah, I'm just going to mess this up, right? right. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to try to give an example. And as you said, we, we don't know the value of the correlation, and that's the problem. If we knew it, then we could, of course, just fix it at what value it would be. But we never know the parameters. That, parameters that's why we estimate stuff. Okay, so let's look at this uh, example. So what we have here is uh, 129 female subjects that heard a story, or they read a story, I don't know. They got the story of a female lawyer that was dis uh, discriminated due to sex. Uh, and the treatment was that some of these subjects heard a story where this female lawyer protest against, protested against this and said, this is not okay. Whereas in the other part, the other subjects, uh, the lawyer didn't react. So the mediator is then how the subjects uh, thought that the, the, the appropriateness of the response, so if it was an appropriate response or not. And the outcome is the general liking of this uh, female lawyer, so if you like this lawyer or not. And then we have the moderator here, sexism. And that's a measure of whether or not the subject thinks that sexism is a problem in general in society. And the story, kind of would be, the story here kind of would be that, uh, and we have then the XZ, which is the um, interaction between these two. Um, and the story would be, 
if um, if you have if you think that sexism is a large problem in society, uh, and the female lawyer protests against this, then you might like her even more because she's a good role model for society, right? But if you don't think it's a good problem, then you might think, well, good for her that she reacted in this situation, but you don't you don't uh, think that it's more important than just that. So that might affect how. Uh, how you like her according to uh, the appropriateness of the response. Uh, but there could be, of course, uh, confounders here. And that's the, that's the problem. But let's first just look at the outcome of this uh, model. And uh, so we have first liking, so the outcome variable. And I should say that all of these are continuous now, except the treatment variable, of course, which is binary. So liking on the um, uh, mediator, the exposure, the moderator, and then all these. The only thing that is significant in this whole model is the interaction on the mediator. So that's kind of surprising, first of all, given what we saw in the power analysis. But that's the only significant thing here. But let's go on and look at uh, the effect here. So this is the plot that we looked at before. We, we didn't look at the input yet, but you kind of know how to get this with the model indirect command by now. So we have sexism, the moderator, and the indirect effect as a function of the moderator. So depending on how much you think sexism is a problem in society, the indirect effect differs, right? So as you can see here, uh, five is the mean of sexism, four and six is the 20th and the 80th percentile of sexism. Uh, so you can see that for almost all values of sexism between the 20th and the 80th percentile, the confidence interval of the indirect effect does not cover zero, only for the lower part here which would uh, explain why it's a significant effect, uh, that we see that significant effect. So if sexism is, if you think that sexism is a large problem in society, then uh, the effect will increase. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah so if, if you think that sexism is a problem, uh, a, a appropriate response will increase your liking of this lawyer more than if you do not think that sexism is a problem. That was what I was trying to say. All right, so how did we get this output? Well, you kind of know by now. We created the, the uh, interaction variable in a defined statement. We used the bootstrap, 1,000 samples in this case, and the bootstrap confidence interval here as kind of default now when we use the maximum likelihood estimator for mediation models. Uh, and then in the model indirect command, we specified the outcome and then mod option for moderated mediation, the mediator, the moderator, and for which values we want to see the plot, the plot we just saw. So this corresponds to that. And then the interaction variable, and finally protest, which is the exposure. No values in parentheses because it's a binary treatment or tr binary exposure. So we will see it for the default shift 0 to 1. And then we ask for plot uh, type plot type equals plot three, and we saw one of these plots, but then we also now ask for the sensitivity plot, which is the new thing here. So the sensitivity plot will give us a plot uh, looking like the one Bank talked about. And we'll look at this plot now. All right. So if you just look at this plot, and think about what we can see here. So essentially what Bank said, the no confounder assumption uh, that is, there is no variable that we didn't measure that affects both the mediator, which is uh, the appropriateness of the response, and the outcome, which is uh, the liking. Uh, we assume that there is no, no unmeasured confounder, no unmeasured variable that affects both of these. And I think that's probably uh, not true. I mean, there could be many things. In this case, it was only females. But if it would have been both genders, then the gender might af uh, affect how you react to the response and how, you, how much you like this individual and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that could confound this relation. But how it, what it implies, though, this assumption is, as Bank said, zero correlation between the residuals of the mediator and the outcome. And we don't know what it is because we, can't, we cannot identify this correlation. So what we do is that we fix the correlation at different values. So one of these values is the true value. Now we go from 0 0.9 to 0, uh, minus 0 0.9 to 0 0.9. Uh, so we don't, we don't cover up to one because that's not reasonable. But some of these values are the correct one. We don't know what it is. But some, some of this uh, value is the correct uh, correlation. We don't know it. So some of the effect estimate, which is the point estimate in the middle here, is the, is the, is the true value, so to speak. But the question is, we have assumed zero. So what the model would give us is the zero value. 
So this is the value we get. It's a significant effect because the confidence interval does not cover zero. So the question is, what if we're wrong about this assumption? What if we have an unmeasured confounder that causes correlation? How large can this correlation be without messing up this interpretation? Because here now we have a positive effect, right? So what we see here in this plot is that for uh, negative correlations up until 0 0.25, the confidence interval does not cover zero. And uh, that, I mean, that will at least guarantee that we have the right kind of sign on the effect, right? So we interpret it in the right direction, even though we might not get the exact right point estimate like Bank showed, uh, it might still be on the right direction. But as we can see here, if it's larger than 0 0.25, it's the correlation between the residual of the mediator uh, appropriateness of response and the outcome likeliness is larger than 0 0.25, then the confidence interval covers zero and actually becomes negative after a while. So this tells us that the assumption that we've made is actually very sensitive. And therefore, it's a sensitivity analysis. It's sensitive to violations. If we have some correlation that is larger than 0 0.25, then the results that we see in the model does not hold any longer. So that tells me that this is a very sensitive model to this assumption. So I wouldn't go ahead and say that, well, this holds. This is super true, because uh, I haven't measured all the confounders, so I, I don't trust it. However, if I saw that, like in Bengt's plot, that it took uh, correlations up to, say, 0 0.75 or something, then I could argue, like Bengt said, I, don't think, I cannot think of a confounder or several confounders that would cause that high correlation. I mean, some correlation, sure, but not, not 70, 0 0.75. So therefore, it's not likely that there is such a confounder, and therefore, my results are not sensitive to this assumption. And do you have anything to add, Bengt? Otherwise, we will hit the modern mediation analysis. Great. OK, are you ready for a paradigm shift? Are you going to do the dance? I'll do a stumbling trick. Um, yeah, so we're going to gently move you in this modern direction. Um, we're going to take it in several steps. Can you, can you wait until after, or is it uh, central to this now? OK, yeah. It's better if we comp compile all the questions to the Q&A. So, we're going to take uh, some gentle steps towards um, getting you into this topic. It's quite uh, a dense topic. If you try to read these uh, articles that have come out in the last uh, decade by people like uh, Judy Pearl or Tyler Vanderweel or uh, Imai or Greenland and uh, who else? Rubin. Rubin too, yes, right. Um, then. Uh, you might get very lost in the statistical nomenclature. Uh, so we'll try to show it in terms of pictures and formulas and examples, and do some of it right now before lunch, and uh, most of it after lunch, OK? Whoops. All right, so first question then. Modern uh, mediation analysis, often referred to as causal inference or causal effects based on counterfactuals. So the first question is, why do we need them? Weren't we happy the way things were? When you could just take A times B to be the indirect effect. Um, I mean, I call them uh, gamma 1 times beta 1, but it's really A times B, right? Things were fine and happy and simple. But that approach to defining an indirect effect does not generalize to all models. And we need to be general because we need to handle the models that we talked about before coffee. So the question is, have you used A times B incorrectly then? Uh, should we feel bad or worry here? Well, typically you have not, but in some cases, yes, yes. But if you have simple cases where M and Y are continuous and you don't have that M times X interaction, you have not made any error. So big sigh there. But um, when it comes to um, cases uh, that are more complex, then you need a more general approach to defining the effects. And that's based on counterfactuals. So the good thing is then that that approach, which we will teach you, uh, has, gives the same effects as you have been used to, typically then with linear models with continuous M and Y. Uh, except for the M, M times X interaction where we really didn't have any uh, 
standard. We didn't have any classic results for that, really. So, but you're going to get new effects when you have, say, a binary mediator or a binary Y, or both of them binary. You're going to get new effects when you have a count Y, a censored Y, or a two-part Y, and many other combinations as well. So this is the general approach of which what we've done, A times B, is a very special case. And you will see that it comes out as a special case. So this is described um, uh, by Robbins, was the person I was thinking about, Pearl, Van der Riel, and Imai. And it's described in the book in two chapters, chapter four for continuous mediator, continuous outcome. So there you get most of the standard results, except the uh, x times m interaction, which is a little bit new, I think. But then in chapter eight, that's where the uh, things heat up, and you have uh, indirect and direct effects for other types of variables, binary outcome, binary mediator, count outcome, two-part outcome. So the question then is, how do you go about counterfactually defining these indirect and direct effects? And like I said, we're going to try to make it as easy as possible for you. It's a complex literature, and some of you may prefer to just sit down with the book in hand and, and try to read it as an introduction to this huge literature. And we're going to focus on randomized treatment, binary. So here we go, folks. Hold on to your hats. So I'm going to take a hypothetical, hypothetical examples here that shows you how to think about potential outcomes, counterfactuals, and causal effects. I came up with this example of six individuals, a data set with n equals six to illustrate these things. And what you have here is the x variable, the exposure, the treatment control variable. And I'm making up these hypothetical data. I'm, say, I'm saying that the first individual was randomized to the treatment group. So was the second individual. But the third individual was randomized to the control group. Fourth to the treatment group. Fifth and sixth subject to the control group. All right? Those are, are real, real values. Well, as real as they get when you make it up. But now, now we're going to take a look at the two potential outcomes columns. And we're going to talk about what y is. We're going to talk about y in the case that x was equal to 1, and y in the case that x was equal to 0. So here, we get the value 11. And I have a box around it, because that value actually was observed. It's y when x is equal to 1. The y for x equals 0 is counterfactual. It didn't happen. It's a potential outcome. The 9 here was never observed, because the person was randomized into treatment. But had the person been randomized into control, he or she would have obtained the value 9. But now they got, he, he or she got the value 11. Are you with me so far? All right. So the next person, similarly, had 14 and 10. And the third person, which was in the control group, so we have to have a box in this column, you know, because it's unobserved and in the treatment group, gets five. And the next person was a treatment group person, so the value nine becomes realized, whereas the value eight becomes, remains potential and unobserved. And then for individuals five and six, you end up in the x equals zero column, you get observed there. So you get these one, two, three, four, five, six observed values. So now these statisticians say, well, the true causal effect uh, on the individual level is, of course, the difference between the y value that you would have obtained or, or did obtain when x was 1 minus the one for when x was 0. So it's 11 minus 9 is 2. 14 minus 10 is 4. 8 minus 5 is 3. Those are the causal effects. And now you would complain, of course, and say, well, we never observed those. How, what, what's the value of this? OK, just hold on, wait. <laughs> the clever statisticians then, they reason on the level of the individual, subscript i, but they analyze the whole sample. You can work with means, even if individual observations of causal effects are not observed. You can create the mean here 
You have one, two, three observations for x equals one. The mean is 11.33, the observed mean. And here, the observed mean is the average of those three, nine. The true average is the average of all six. That becomes 11.83. The true average of these is nine, it happens to be the same thing here. The true causal effect is 2.83, that minus that. The sample of the, uh, the mean in the sample is 11.33 minus 9, which is that. And the argument is then that these two values will become close. This is, an, this is an estimate of that, which is valid because you have randomization of people into treatment and control groups. And if you have a large enough sample, that is going to be coming very close to that. That's how the statisticians reason. It's pretty smart, right? Yeah. That's how they earn their living. <laughs> so uh, there, from there, you go to this. And actually, I've never seen this table elsewhere, but I like it. Uh, now you have to do some uh, handiwork here. You want to put a brace above those two columns. Put a brace around those two columns. And then a brace uh, over these four columns. Slash over brace. All right, so it's the same, it's the same six people. Uh, so we have x and we have y, but now we're going to introduce m. m was not in the previous slide. M, there's no m here, right? It's only x and y. But now we're going to introduce m. So uh, we're gonna, I'm going to make up m values here. So the first person uh, was randomized to treatment, and we are then uh, observing m for the x equal 1 possibility, that is treatment group m. If the person had been put in the control group, his m value would be 0. But we're not observing that. And for individual 3, put in the control group, uh, the zero for both those, but we happen to observe that zero for the control, the M for the control group. Now, for these four columns, that's Y for the different combinations. It's a two by two combination for X and M. One, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, zero. This 11 that I, you see here is the same 11 that I have here. It's the observed Y. Uh, why did I place it there? Well, because it is the y for x equals 1 and m equals 1. So it gets put there rather than in the other three columns. Isn't this a fun game? Yeah. <laughs> you can do this all day long, and it has nothing to do with reality, so it's nice. <laughs> so, uh, and then for individual 3, you have uh, the person was put in the control group, so we observe the m value for x in the control group. We don't observe that one. Uh, and y then becomes a 1, 0 combination. So let's see. Oh, or uh, actually, zero zero. 0, 0. Thank you. So over there, 5. Thank you. Sorry? So uh, 0, 0. x is 0, and m is 0. M, the m value is 0. So we put it over there. And onwards and upwards for all these combinations. I'm not making up these uh, potential values because there are too many to make up and they don't, they're not needed at this point. <clears throat> so then you can take averages here. You know, that's what we work with, the averages. And there are two kinds. You may want to put a brace again uh, under these two averages. They have to do with the M distribution. Why do I say that the average here is 0.667? Well, you see that for uh, uh, x equals 1, you have m equals 1, 1, and 0. So two of the three observed values in the x equals 1 column are 1. So that's 2 over 3. That's 0 0.66. Whereas in the m, m values for x equals 0, you have 0, 0, 1. So you have only 1 out of 3 uh, that has m equals 1. So it looks like. Um, x equals 1 tends to give m equals 1. x equals 0 t tends to give m equals 0. So you get those, that's the distribution of m for the two x values. 
All right, and then you get the means here for the different columns. So you see that y, say, say that now uh, x is a good treatment, it's a treatment that's supposed to increase m, a treatment that's supposed to increase y. Uh, the highest y value is obtained when, when you're in treatment and the m value is 1. So x has an effect, positive effect on m. That's the highest value. Lowest value is when you're in control group and m is 0. It can certainly happen that even if you're in the control group, m could be 1. And it gives you 10 at least. Uh, but the best thing is if you're in the treatment group and you, treatment is managed, managed it to switch m to 1, because then you get the highest y value. These four means, together with the distribution for m here, are the building blocks for the counterfactual effects. This example, the data are there. You have values of x, m, and y you can by hand compute all the indirect and direct effects you want. And you do it by a counterfactual method that we're going to teach you. And uh, it is a model that doesn't assume any distribution, any uh, models, I should say, is a situation that does not assume uh, a specific regression model, logistic or probit. You know, you have a binary M, binary Y. It doesn't assume anything. It's a non-parametric uh, analysis, uh, therefore a very assumption-free analysis. And by that, <clears throat> before you get lunch, Morton is going to entertain you <laughs> and say the same thing in a totally different way. Yeah. <laughs> right. OK, so I'm just going to try to give some intuition for this, exactly what Bengt said. So this is just another take on the same thing, really. So let's assume we have this mediation model here. We have a gene. It's a binary gene. You either have this gene or you don't have this gene. We have a mediator, which is number of cigarettes you smoke per day. And we, we view this as a continuous uh, uh, variable at this point. And then the outcome is the risk of cancer. And we also view this as a continuous. It's some kind of continuous scale of risk in this setting. So the story here is that if you have this gene, then you're known to have a higher risk of cancer. But the problem is that if you have this gene, you're also known to smoke more cigarettes, in average. Might be uh, connected to uh, addictiveness behavior or, uh, or something like that. So the, the question is, how much of this effect of the gene on the risk of cancer is actually a direct effect, maybe due to mutations or something like that? And how much is just because you smoke more cigarettes? Because if you smoke a lot of cigarettes, you have a higher risk of cancer. So that's the kind of question we want to answer here. We want to separate the effect of the gene into a direct effect and an indirect effect medi mediated by the cigarette consumption. And as I suggested by the quote of Van der Wehle, we might want to add this moderation here. So it might be even worse for you to smoke cigarettes if you have the gene. Say that you're sensitive to mutation because you have the gene and you start smoking a lot of cigarettes, it might be even worse for you to, to, uh, to actually smoke cigarettes. And then we might have confounders, right? I just added one here to kind of uh, symbolize all the confounders we could have. H could be one, for example. I don't know if young people these days smoke more than old or the other way around, but it, I guess it has some kind of effect, and especially has an effect on the risk of cancer, right? The older you get, unfortunately, the higher the risk of cancer. And the way we would model this is simply by these two uh, equations, the, the regression of the number of cigarettes, or the continuous number of cigarettes, and the outcome the risk on the cigarettes, the gene, and also the interaction between these two. And then the, uh, the covariate age is in both of, of these, of course. So now the question is, how can we identify the causal effects for a model like this? What, what do we need to, to identify or need to find? So I'm going to do this uh, very crude here in, this, in the sense that I'm going to show you that we only need four expected values, really, just like Bengt already hinted. So let the risk here, the expected risk of a person be the red area here. I don't know if you can see it, if it's red. I don't see it. I'm colorblind. So, uh, so this, the red area is the, the risk of cancer for this person. So we might add then that this is the risk of a person that doesn't have the gene and it smokes only one cigarette. So it, it smokes as much as if it didn't have the gene, right? So it doesn't have the gene and it smokes accordingly. And we could consider the other expected risk, someone who has the gene, 
and smokes as much as if this individual had the gene. So it smokes more because it has the gene, right? You have three cigarettes here. So you have the gene and you smoke as much as if you did. So that's kind of reasonable, right, to think about those two expected values. But then comes what I would call the less intuitive expected values or counterfactuals. And this is the expected cancer risk of a person that don't have the gene, but smoke as much as if they had the gene. So you don't have the gene, but you smoke as much as if you did. What would your expected risk be then? And finally, the second non-intuitive expected value, you have the gene, but you smoke as much as if you didn't. So you have the gene, but you smoke as much as if you didn't. So this gives us then four expected values, right? And the on-diagonals one are, at least for me, intuitive. You have the gene and you smoke as much as if you did. You don't have the gene and you smoke as, if, as much as if you didn't. And then we have the counterfactuals or, or the less intuitive expected values here that are you have the gene but smoke as much as if you didn't. And you don't have the gene but smoke as much as if you did. And these are just four expected values, right? And that's the only thing we need to define the causal effect. So the causal effect, the natural indirect effect, is simply the expected value of an individual having the gene smoking as much as if they had the gene minus the expected value of someone having the gene smoking as much as if they didn't. So we keep the, the gene level fixed at on here, but we change the level of the mediator from the level it would have been if you had the gene to the level it would have been if you didn't have the gene. So only the indirect effect, the effect of the shift in the mediator due to if you have the gene or not. And correspondingly, we could look at the natural direct effect where we do the same thing, but we keep the cigarette level, the amount of cigarettes you smoke, fixed on the level you would smoke if you didn't have the gene. So we keep the mediator fixed at the level you would smoke if you didn't have the gene, and we change the gene from on to off, which would hold a mediator constant, which would give us only the direct effect of the gene on the risk. And of course, you can write this in formulas like Bank did. Not as fun, maybe, but. Uh, and this is simply what we do, right? We can flip between these two, and you have both in, in the paper, I guess, so this is the same thing. And as Bengt said, we do not assume any functional form here. We haven't assumed anything at this point. So as long as we can find some expression for this, these, expect, these four expected values, we can find the, the correct causal effect, really. So as long as we can... Uh, find an analytic solution, we can implement this in M plus, and some of these effects already are implemented in M plus, of course, but this shows the, the general, generality of this uh, assumption, we don't, of this uh, definition. This always holds. So as long as we can calculate these four expected values, we can always find these effects. So that was my take on that. And I guess uh, we'll stop there, right? Uh, yeah, that's all we wanted to cover before uh, lunch, but... Um Rest assured, even if you didn't understand any of what either one of us said, M plus does it for you. <laughs> you may have to interpret the results, but you know, just say indirect or direct effect. It's done right. M plus customer support. Yeah. Well, don't. <laughs> Don't, uh, yeah. But on the other hand, if you learn this definition, even if it takes a lot of time, it took a lot of time for me, for sure, when you, have, when you have understood it, then it works for everything. So it's kind of a very general tool to have in your toolbox, I think. And the reason we, why we emphasize it is because there's been a lot of confusing discussion about this uh, on the applied networks like SEMnet, for instance. And it's almost impenetrable when people go back and forth. But there is, there is really a simple story behind this. So we try to make you more able to read the literature. And the person that I find is the clearest writer on this is uh, Tyler Vandervale. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but he has this 2015 book, which actually I don't think is as good as his articles because the articles are really to the point. Uh, and in the book, I, we try to point out which articles are the most uh, readable. But you know they keep coming out. I'll tell you tell, tell you more this afternoon about new articles, 2017, and they use exactly this uh, nomenclature, this notation and thinking. So you can get much more out of the literature if you try to penetrate this. And it may go too, by too fast right now, but then you t take the book, sit down in a comfortable chair, and, and sit and think about it. I, I did that in uh, September 2011 when I wrote the first paper on this, and it was actually fun. 
piece it together. But if you, if you have that interest. All right. So now we had a question from uh, a gentleman. Was it you? No. You. Yes. You had a question. Do we have a microphone here which can actually help you now. So um, actually, just where we left off, uh, slides 90 and 91, I think I kind of zoned out with the pictures on there. Um, but could you describe um, just kind of what's going on with the natural indirect effect and then the difference between that and the natural direct effect? Yeah, so what we try to find here is, is the effect of the gene that is not caused by you actually smoking more cigarettes and the effect uh, caused by you smoking more cigarettes. I mean, what, what I tried to make the case in the beginning in the diagram picture was that it will affect it in, in two ways. So if, 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 if it might affect it in two ways. It might affect your mutation, I don't know, intensity in the, gene, in the cells or something. But it might also affect that you smoke more. And if you smoke more, then you will have a higher risk of cancer. So it affects it in two ways. So the indirect effect is the effect that you would have because you smoke more if you have the gene. So how, how, much would, how much would the risk uh, increase if you, if you were smoking due to that you have the gene? And the direct effect is, is when you don't look at that effect of smoking. You don't want to take the effect of smoking into account. You say, well, if, we, if, if they didn't smoke more, what would be the, the effect in that case? If I could force a gene carrier to not smoke, how much of the effect would remain? That's very interesting for policy, for example. Say that it's almost only an indirect effect through the <laughs> amount of smoking, then it would make a lot of sense to put efforts to make people quit smoking for this gene carrier group. However, if it turns out to be that most of this effect is actually a direct effect and due to some gene mutation thing, uh, then it might not help. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that helped. But. Okay. I, I got to tell you about this model that I, I made it up totally, the example. <laughs> I, I was just, I, I tried to figure out, the, for me, the simplest case where you could have these counterfactuals in an understandable. No, and I haven't, no. Yeah, this is just something that I, I made it up from, from, from some example that was kind of this, but not really this. We have a question over here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and this is related to slide 74. How do I specify a row in my model? Is it just M with Y? And should I specify a value a priori if I feel that like I'm not sufficiently controlling for confounding? No, you, you don't have to specify any row at all. All you have to do is say sensitive. No, but that's not what he means. He means if, if he believes a priori that there is Oh, if you have a certain idea, yeah. Yeah. then, then yeah, that, that's what you would do with. With. Okay. With at. Yeah. But that's. So but does that refer to the covariances or the correlations? It's the covariance between the residuals. So you would, yeah, you would restrict the, the covariance, but we just talk about the correlation because it's a good metric for the plot yeah. size. But that would be the uh, exception, I would think. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, here. Oh, OK. Well, there. <laughs> Pass it over there first. Uh, on slide 72 and 74. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to make sure on slide, so the, the code on 74 doesn't appear to match the output on 72. Maybe I'm just missing something, but the output on no. 72 has that's, XZ and That's a that? very well spotted, actually. It's okay. a, I don't know if you want to tell them why you did it in that way. Yeah, well, we did the, the analysis uh, first uh, trying all different, all different effects here. But then it turned out that this was the only one significant. So in the next analysis, we only put in the XC here. So yeah. So we, uh, the, the thing is that we simplified some examples to fit the slide better. But, but so we yeah. kind of took some parts from the book. And we noticed parts. that that could be a difficult transition. So yeah. And can I ask one more related to the next slide on, okay. on 75? Did you, does it by default pick the moderator at five? Because you really have conditional indirect effects, and you pick the moderator at the mean of five. 
Is that by default or is that you typically run? You see, it says sex is a mean of five. Yeah. Because you really have a conditional Oops. indirect effect here. You, uh, when you have a moderator like that, uh, M plus will give you output for each value of the moderator. OK, so you yeah. can specify the different values of the moderator. You can specify them, or you give the whole range in the output. Yeah. So now we go over to this gentleman, then. So the same, I have a question this If you could hold on one second, then we get it. I have, a, I have a mic back here. Where are you? Still back here. Oh, you still have it Hanging there. out. <laughs> You're hogging it, huh? Yeah, OK. You can go ahead, then. Ask your question. So, so if you notice here, the, there is a narrow band of rho wherein the indirect effect is statistically insignificant. Above 0.6 of rho, the indirect effect comes back to significance, but just that it flips signs. Should yeah. I be worried about it, or I, I, I ignore that fact? You should be worried. I mean, essentially, yeah. just. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean this, is a, this is a very problematic thing, you know, because if you cannot, uh, <coughs> if you cannot, if you cannot argue that you're sure that uh, the correlation is not uh, what it is, I mean, this kind of messes up the whole thing, right? If, if you would have this kind of behavior very close to zero here, where it goes up and down, or where it goes f first significant, then significant, then you're not, since you're not sure what kind of correlation you have, you're not sure if you're even interpreting it in the right sign. Okay. So you would not, I mean, you will always be uncertain about the, the size of the effect because it will always be, you will not be exactly zero even if it's close to zero, right? So say that the true value is zero point, uh, minus 0 0.2, then this is the true effect and this is the estimated effect. Okay. So the size will be different, but sometimes even the sign. So okay. you will totally misinterpret the model if you have this guy. So that's why it's very important to look for this kind of thing. Thank you. One more short question, please. Sorry, Mike. OK, or? so let's give you the microphone so we can hear you. So I was just going to ask, does it make more sense? Would it make more sense if rho were on the x, sorry, the y-axis, and what's on your y-axis was on the x-axis? If it would, more, you, I mean, make would more it sense? I mean, would it be easier to visualize that if you had your axis split? Uh, I've never thought about that. I guess, I mean, I guess. Why, why do you say that? Yeah, good. Um, it just makes more sense for the continuous variable to be. If on you could, if you can read the same story out of that picture, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think well, I mean just for other people like. Yeah, if I think the correspond bit to the to the indirect effect as a function of the moderator. So you okay. can always have something. You have the indirect on the y, the, the effect on the y axis, and then you shift something and see what happens. So to visualize you can shift it, the you moderator. Have to flip it. Okay. So, uh, you right, can shift yeah. the, in this case the, the it's it's row rho that influences the effect. So usually, what the predictor you, is is on the x-axis. You could choose that, right? You could flip the axis in plot, right? You, you could probably do that too. Yeah, I think you can actually flip them if you think that makes more sense. All right, more questions. So I have yes, yes. You have a follow up. Yes, slide sixty-four on the randomizing in the simulation. Sixty-four. So I, if I'm not wrong, this is a cross-sectional data at individual i. So if I need to randomize and identify a random interceptor slope, I do not have a cluster data. So how do I randomize that uh, gamma 1? Mm. So is this this heteroscedasticity? I'm trying to exploit that heteroscedasticity and randomizing it? No. How, do, how can I randomize on a simple cross-sectional data you, the you, you gamma don't 1? Have to, you don't have to actively randomize. You're just saying that a coefficient varies across people. You know, you have that in, in regular regression, you can have a coefficient that varies across people. Usually that's done to handle heteroscedasticity in the variant, residual variances. So it's, it's just a way to, uh, to make the model more flexible. It's nothing you have to do in terms of the intervention. OK. All right, more questions? Yes, now we come back to you. So, um, Hold on. <clears throat> Yeah, what I was going to ask is, um, I thought you went really fast on the, the whole issue of mediator outcome confounding and how serious a problem that is. Um, like, you never really described why is it a problem. And so I'm thinking of a different case, which is what, what if X affects both the mediator and the outcome? So we know that X is related to both of them, OK? Then. The, the, the confounding between M and Y is not such a big problem. It's more of a how big is the indirect effect? Am I wrong about that? 
Uh, I think in one sense, yes, because of the plot that we saw. I mean, so the confounder assumption, I mean, that's a kind of a, a critical part, as you say. What we say is that if you have something that affects both M and Y that is not in the model, if you control for it, then it's fine. Like you said, if you have an X that you... And what if X affects both M and Y? Well, that's a standard, that's a standard mediation model. Well, but then it, let's say they are, let's say there's a th another variable that affects both uh, M and Y. Yeah. So, so that's C. this picture here. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't even know what it is. Right. Yeah. So what? The it's, a problem. Yeah. it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, but it's a problem. It's, I think it's a very good question. The problem is that if you don't, if you don't add it into the model, the residuals here will be correlated. And then you might, then, then you might move the question, so what? what but the, the question then is that, it, as we can so see from the sensitivity plot, it matters for the effect sizes. And it matters for the sign of the effect, even. So it matters, it, it matters, you have to include it because otherwise these are correlated. If they are severely correlated, you might misinterpret mo the model totally. Well, I, I don't deny that it would be good to have C. <laughs> I mean, that, no. that would be always very good. No. But if you don't have C, the example you give is where you don't have C. No. Yeah, right. And that's why you need to do the sensitivity analysis. And you have to think about, could there be a C out there? Can I imagine a C that would cause this strong correlation? No. All I'm saying is that the problem you're, you're raising, I think, and unless I'm completely confused here, is that M and Y could be totally related because of a confound. Yeah. In which case, there's no, there is no mediation. It's zero. But if you know that X affects both M and Y, then the question becomes, could M account for that? Right? I don't follow you. <laughs> the, the, uh, the problem uh, is mediator outcome confounding, uh, which you don't get rid of even if you randomize. And that's the topic of the first block in the afternoon. That's the concern that, in that case, the, uh, the uh, effects aren't identifiable, the indirect effects. But if you have absurd variables that influence M and Y and are not influenced by X, then you, then you can handle it. And that's the case that you have, that you see here. And the reasoning about this, I, I really recommend Van der Veele's book, even though you might like the papers more. I think the book really makes the case for why the confounder why assumption is important and how we can kind of at least do something about it, the sensitivity analysis. I think he flips between these two concepts Since of confounding and coral. sensitivity analysis really well. At least it helped me a lot, but I don't know. More questions, okay. Microphone go into the middle. Um, with regards to comparing slide 70 and slide 75 with regards to the sensitivity analysis, what would you say is a reasonable row um, above which you'd be concerned that there is an unmeasured um, residual cross? So I know you, you, we kind of see that visually 0.25 isn't great and that 0.6 is good, but yeah. what is kind of generally yeah. thought to be um, good in the literature? I I haven't seen that discussed in the literature. I don't know if you have. No. I don't think anybody would want to commit. <laughs> you know, it's the commitment problem as usual. But, uh, but, but I mean, uh, it, 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 pro it relies on uh, your, under your knowledge about the substantive area, uh, how big you, uh, you think it could be. But you're asking perhaps which value, but what are you asking? Are you asking what value is big? Or like when would it, when would this model be sensitive? Like, right, yeah. exactly. What would kind of be a general yeah. threshold, or is it so subject specific that you know it depends on whether you're working with data that's hugely large, like GWAS data, or if you're dealing with kind of counts in a small trial? Yeah, I think there's no good answer to that question, and that's kind of the problem. We always, in the end, have to kind of have some kind of knowledge about what is reasonable and not, and that kind of feels arbitrary, right? If if it's a sensitive model or not, but I think. At least in the terms, when I've, when I've come, looked at real data, if you find a, a model that makes sense and you, and you look at the sensitivity, for that case at least, I've, I've felt confident that the, I cannot imagine any confounder. If, if I could measure anything I wanted, I cannot come up with anything that I would want to measure that would create such a large correlation between the residuals. You, I mean, you can try. You can try in the simulation study. You can create a C that has slopes on M and Y in the simulation study and try different effect sizes and see, like maybe say that you left out 
gender, and you think that that has a certain effect. You can try that. You can try it out and see how large would that effect have to be to create this correlation or, or to mess this up. I mean, it's a matter of uh, how, how likely you think uh, a value of 0 0.6 is. Yeah. Uh, 0 0.6 is a fairly strong misspecification. You left out quite a lot then. Uh, Type 1 or type 2 error? Can we have a vote? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, not sure I want to go there now. <laughs> okay, let's pass the microphone forward to this lady. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question about slide 55. Yeah, I, have, uh, I wonder if beta 3 is significantly different from 0. So should you just report that it's significant to moderate, uh, moderate mediation? Or should you just compare different levels, uh, uh, indirect e uh, effect at different level of x, and then report whether there is a, a significant moderate mediation? So it seems that the p-value for beta 3 and the word test for different level of uh, indirect, if, uh, yeah, indirect if effect at different level of x, sometimes it's not very consistent. No. So do you I understand what I mean? Yeah, so you could, you, uh, could you uh, li hand your microphone over to your seatmate? He nodded, and he has something he wants to. Good. <laughs> Just yeah, so just no, I think I understand. Okay, have so, a first step. So say that uh, beta 3 is significant, right? But then you uh -huh. look at the plot of the, the indirect effect as a function of the, of the moderator, and you see that for some values it's not significant, or the confidence interval covers zero for a short bit. Uh, so I understand the question. I don't have a good answer, though, I guess. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any insight in that? Like, I think there is one example. Do you have the? Which yeah, you I want to switch. Want this. Yeah, because I think there is one example you know, there. Was it this one where only so only this one or sorry only this one was significant and then we looked at this one and we saw that so in this case we had kind of the significance here of the beta three which is this slope mm -hmm. and then we looked at the effect and we see that for some values here it covers zero mm -hmm. is that what you're asking yes so for what it has to, um, so what would be the conclusion here what would you report yeah what time? conclusion can you just beta three is significantly different from zero can we conclude that there is moderated oh. mediation no i, I would go by, i would go by that plot yeah. that's the ultimate Talk less about significance as a binary choice here. Significance yes. so, for some values. Okay. Don't, so don't maybe go you by should beta 3, but go by those confidence bands. Yeah. OK, maybe you show a root plot. Yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah, I have a last question. So um, sorry. That's OK. Yeah, so uh, this is for slide 48. So, oh, oh, not for the, sorry, sorry. Mm, it's slide 48. Hold on, not 48. It's Mm. Oh, slide uh, 72. So I have a question about uh, conducting the moderated mediation. So if theoretically I think the moderator uh, influence both the A path and B path, so M on X and yeah. Y on M, so should I begin with a big model like what you are doing for these slides and then reduce the non-significant interaction? Yeah. Or should I start from a smaller model and increase? Yeah, I guess that's kind of what Van der is drawing on, that you maybe should start with in including these, because even though you might not find them significant due to that you need so large samples to, find, uh, to have power for them, you, you might want to include them because they might mess up the dynamics of this, uh, this mediation system, really. So I, I kind of would suggest that in this case, rather than building it up, I would start by having all these mode. and okay. see maybe if, if, if they are very uh, very insignificant, which is a weird thing to say, but if it, if it is and uh -huh. you take it out and it doesn't affect any of the effects, if mm -hmm. it doesn't change the indirect, indirect effect, well then maybe you can leave it out. 
but maybe you should start by having it so you don't miss any important. A big model. Start yeah. from a big model. Sorry, I have a third question. The last question. <laughs> the last okay, question. That has to be the, the last, last one. one because then we have to go to lunch. Okay. So, uh, in yeah, for your examples, you have the treatment as a dummy variable that is control and treatment. So if I have a three categorical variable like one treatment and the one control, so is it enough to just uh, create two dummy variables? And uh, for the x, I mean, and uh, create the interaction of uh, the moderator with the two dummy variables and put in the model. Yeah, yeah. So you have two treatment, two different treatments. And yeah, one two control. different treatments. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much.